love deeply and declare brightly. Let's pray for God's help, shall we? Heavenly Father, I pray that by your living and enduring word today, you'll help to shape our understanding and our emotions, that we might love one another deeply and declare your praises brightly. In Jesus' name, amen. My name is Luke, and um, happy to be here. There are two things to learn from today's passage. Love deeply and declare brightly. That's inside and outside. And we want both to be healthy, right? Whether we're having caffeine or not, we want to be healthy inside and have good skin. Now, I went to this Middle Eastern city, and you'll see these houses. They look really dirty, dirty on the outside. But I can tell you inside... They are clean, they are shoes off, they are hospitable and wonderful to be inside. Dirty outside, clean inside. Here's another one, a gorgeous house. I've never been here, but um, it's in Florida. It's beautiful on the outside. It's, It's like a, just you want to be there, swim in the pool. And it's Al Capone's mansion. In Miami Beach, now if you don't know who he was, he, inside this house, were murderous plots and death. Amazing outside, but death and cold inside. And today in 1 Peter, we have these two parts, and we're going to do it in two parts as well. First, love deeply, from verse 22. Remember, this is a letter to God's elect to those who are given new birth, to those who are protected and safe, yet suffering uh, suffering but joyful. And Peter is writing to Christians, to people who know Jesus. And in this first section, how should we be on the inside? And by that I mean, how does Peter want Christians to be amongst themselves, between ourselves? Let's look a little bit more closely. Verse 22, now that you've purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. If you, just, if you have your Bible open, go back to chapter 1, verse 3, and you'll see there the same idea of new birth. Peter said earlier, uh, we've, received, we've been born again, we've been given new birth into a living hope. And then further down in verse 15, it's sort of focused more when Peter says, be holy, really God's voice from the Old Testament, be holy in everything that you do. There's like a a refining of that. And this gets even further in verse 22 that we have today. Now that you have sincere love for each other. The older translations have brotherly love. The word underneath it is Philadelphia. That means the love of brothers, brother and sister. It's a family love here that they have as a result of purifying themselves. They've obeyed the truth, so they have this sincere love between them. But then we get this other love. It's like we get love, love times two, love one another deeply from the heart. Hmm. So it seems like new birth is focused then on to be holy. Holy is, ref- is, is more clear in terms of you have this brotherly love and therefore love one another deeply from the heart. There are, there are different words underneath, but the emphasis is on action. Not just that you have this love, but you're to do this love. And if you look back, peek down into verse 23, why? For you've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable So we have new birth all the way back in verse 3, and we have new birth here in verse 23, and they sort of pincer movement together onto the love that we ought to have, love one another deeply from the heart. It's loving one another deeply. It's not just, okay, that you've been brought into a, a family by your relationship to Jesus, not that you just have family love, but you're to earnestly do that, to deeply do that. And it's not just sincere love. You can have sincere love, which is very shallow. I mean, sincerity means that you you don't lie to someone, you don't have any deceit. But this says, no, it's from the heart. It's actually emotional. It's actually all of you. It has traction on who you are. 
And it's not just that you have this love among you, but that you actively do it. There's a leaning into it. There's a we and us. What will this love look like for us at Ormond at 10? We're going to answer that question, but I want to just go down a little bit in the passage to the beginning of chapter 2, which says, Rid yourselves of all malice and deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. What a list. I bet some are thinking, wow, I'm so glad we don't have any of that in our church. I won't get you to put your hand up. But it is an ugly list, isn't it? Malice, that is like purposefully doing bad to someone. Deceit, thinking one thing, saying another, or hoping people will believe a lie about you. Hypocrisy, it's like one step further. It's actually open, showing a positive thing, but critical inside. You could be envious or jealous. Jealous of that person's status or influence. Jealous of their musical ability. Jealous of their house. Envious of their kids or the fact that they have a wife or a husband or they have time. So many things for us to envy others about and we're told not to do it. And slander, not just regular slander, but slander of every kind. Every kind, every kind that puts someone else down. Anything that drops them in, in your view, just a little bit, just a peg or two. Anything which makes me think a little bit lower of them. I think slander is, is not just... We are called to call people to account and sometimes we say bad things about other people. But slander has got the intent of just bringing that person down just a little bit in the view of the other. Peter says to get rid of those things. They're not compatible with loving one another deeply from the heart. But instead, verses 2 and 3, we're to crave crave not just like oh I'll, I'll some might, might be wanting a cup of coffee after after the service no this is really wanting pure spiritual milk which is the nourishment from God's word this image of actually like a baby getting everything they need from that milk the desire is to grow up into maturity so what will it look like what will it look like for us to love one another deeply from the heart? Now, there's many ways that I see people in this congregation loving one another deeply from the heart. And I really give thanks to God for that. Asking, people ask one another, really, how are you going? Someone today asked me that and I didn't quite give an answer and they asked me again. I think, wow, here's someone who really wants to know. Serving, you know, there's, there's about 27 or 29 people serving us today to make this congregation happen today. I'm still new here because I haven't clocked over one year. <laughs> and I wonder if God is growing us to do that in the area of music. I'm not talking about getting better at playing music. I'm talking about how we think and feel and talk about music in church, how we love one another in it. Now I know at the very mention of music, some might be feeling a bit of, bit of tension, taken for granted, past hurt, maybe caricatured, regret, anger, some superiority, some inferiority. You might have been misunderstood, protective, you might be dismissed. Well, first up, God has blessed us with hard-working, musically gifted people, singers, players, and I thank God for you because you are a blessing to us, to our whole congregation. Thank you for your hard work. And they're much more skilled than I could ever be. I did try singing in another church and they told me to just stay in the pew. <laughs> That's okay, I work on other things. But God has used music in our church to help us, to help us sing to one another and to God, to encourage us and even equip us. And in this congregation here, we have different musical cultures coming together. There's been a lot of helpful and some unhelpful comments about music. And as I reflected on 1 Peter this week, I just wonder if the application of love one another deeply from the heart connects with us here. 
Now, if you're new since January, you're thinking, what? Music is fine. <laughs> I'm having a good time. <laughs> Great. <laughs> I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to people who have been part of the 10.45 and the 5 p.m. service, and they have styles or perceived styles. Now, my aim is not through from 1 Peter, not to rebuke us, though you may feel some pain as God's word comes to us and shines on our attitudes and our words. My aim is to encourage us to love one another deeply from the heart. So I see it like this. In general, we have two approaches to music. Now, I'm generalizing. Please don't pick holes in my descriptions. Wait to ask with me, how can we love one another? Okay. I think there are those of us who prioritize participation. Let's call those the P people, participation. And there are those who prioritize quality. We call them the Q people. The P people prioritize participation. We value inclusion and, and vulnerability and giving it a go. And we welcome, God has welcomed us, so we welcome others in the area of music. We like a variety of strings, brass, look at all the brass here today, what people have to offer. We aim for music that's, that's in tune and in sync, of course. We love it when others, even if they're a little bit timid, they get involved. So together, we can sing to God. The Q people prioritize quality and excellence. We value music that is tight and in tune and catchy. We believe such music helps us to worship God better by fully engaging us in singing. We like drums and guitars. We don't have any drums. Oh, here they are, but they lie idle. Drums and guitars to keep the tempo. We value contemporary songs and contemporary styles to connect with the younger generation to make church music attractive. And we prefer perhaps fewer musicians if it means we get better quality so that we can truly have a worshipful experience. Now, I might be getting some of this wrong, but bear with me, please. Now comes the hard bit. Remember, our goal is to love one another deeply from the heart. I've heard some P people say that Q priorities can tend towards performance or empty form. And it can exclude people if they're not up to the right musical standard. People carry pain from being told that they're not good enough that, and they're afraid to offer lest they get told to sit down. How discouraging. I've heard some Q people say that P priorities lead to daggy songs and they're stuck in the 90s or the 80s and that young families might leave church if the music isn't contemporary. And after all of the effort of, of P's choosing songs, rehearsing carefully, it could be very discouraging. Some P's might well ask, is it worth all the effort? How discouraging. How might we love one another deeply from the heart in this? I've got four little suggestions. Number one, let's remember that it's we, that it's we together that God has put us together. Number two, let's be thankful. Let, let's express that thankfulness to others and actually mean it and really listen to the other person's view to understand, not to form a response. And to rejoice in the good of what that other person brings. Their gospel-motivated priorities. Thirdly, let's, let, let's have no slander of any kind in our church. Not to dismiss one another. But instead to say sorry if you suspect you've hurt someone. Or to check in if you need to apologize. I was in a meeting this week when someone used language that was hurtful about music and they followed up with an email to all who were in that meeting to say sorry. And number four, we could invite one another into our music teams. We can get involved with our skills. 
And I'm sure you might have other ways of how love can interface with this issue between us. If you're a more Q quality person, don't give up on your values, okay? But involve others and raise them up. And if you're a P person, don't give up on inclusion and keep striving for excellence. This love within God's people is made possible because of, you see it at the very end if you read ahead to verse 10, his mercy to us. And it's beautiful, like the inside of a welcoming and peaceful home. It's actually God's home. God dwells with us. And God is calling us, this is the first thing to learn, to love deeply. Now, another one of the ways that we love one another deeply is by serving in various volunteer roles. So the second thing for us to remember is to declare brightly. Remember to love deeply and declare brightly. Remember those houses, the inside and the outside. And this is the outside of the house where we are facing the world. We're looking at verses 4 to 10. See, in verses 4 to 5, as we view Jesus rightly, as we view the living stone that is Jesus, God builds us as living stones the terminology from the Old Testament about something which was static but actually given life, he's building us into a beautiful structure. How we see Jesus actually impacts our whole future. In verses 6 to 8, we see these, again, quotes from, from the Old Testament about what it means to view Jesus differently. If, you view, if your view of Jesus is that he's precious to God, verse 6... He's the precious cornerstone, precious to you, verse 7. To you who believe this stone is precious and to be believed, verse 7. That's one way to view Jesus. And there's another way to view him, which is to reject him, verse 7. The stone the builders rejected and therefore one on whom we stumble and trip and fall, verse 8. Because of disobedience. The second option, the second view leads to falling and to disaster. But the first view leads us to this, it's amazing words in verse 9 that such a people are called a a chosen people, a holy priesthood, a a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, like his, his special treasure. And that comes about because of your view of Jesus, whether he's precious to you or not. In verses 9 to 10, these phrases, it's like a collection of these Old Testament diamond jewel phrases about God's people, which in the Old Testament applied to the Israelite nation, but here applies to those who trust in Jesus, who see him as precious. But what is the purpose of of this people who have these different names, chosen people, royal priesthood, and so on. What's the purpose of being a chosen people? There it is in verse 9, if you're on page 1888, as Graham directed us, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness. That's a purpose clause, technically. You do this so that something else happens. Our purpose is to declare brightly, to be outward facing, like Al Capone's house, but without the murder stuff inside, to be beautiful outside, just like it's beautiful inside. Inside, it's in our community to be hospitable, to be peaceful and welcoming, and outside, to be absolutely gorgeous. That's what God is calling us to. And if you stood near a house like this and you just peeked in the window, you'd see people loving one another deeply from the heart. And then if you stopped peeking in but you stood back and you take in the whole group, you'd see a group of people radiating God's light, telling others just how wonderful he is to declare God's praises. And what, what's that actually going to look like as we close? Here's, here's some ideas about declaring God's praises. Actually, you can see these for yourselves. It's not optional. It doesn't say you're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, so some of you could declare the praises of him who... No. 
so that you all together, it's not optional. It's not an optional part of being a Christian. But secondly, it's corporate. It's a together thing. All these are, are plural forms actually in here. Together we do this. We do this as a whole church. We do this as the global church. We do this as the 10 o'clock congregation. You might do it as a home group, as an individual connected to the bigger body, that you are someone sharing what Jesus has done for you. And thirdly, it's proactive. To declare means to speak out. It doesn't mean to just be ready to say something. We do have that later in 1 Peter, to be ready to give a reason for the hope. But this is a, a proactive thing. And some of us are afraid to do that. Partly because of secular Victoria that we live in. Partly for other reasons we're afraid. But this word, this word means to, to take a step forward. To find opportunities and to make opportunities. God is calling us to declare brightly his awesomeness to the world. So to love deeply and to declare brightly. Amen.